blurry. I, the part of the bottom's clear, but the other ones are a bit blurry. I couldn't couldn't fix those. I didn't have a tech, technology expert when, with me when I did that, but that's the only one that looks like that, though. When the 1988 C14 dating results were announced, those who believed that the accumulated evidence pointed toward authenticity considered various reasons why the dates came out medieval instead of first century. Several main ideas were proposed, including the idea by various people that the sample had actually been taken from a repaired area of the shroud. Enzo Di Lorenzo, a member of the Turin Commission that studied the shroud in 1969 and 73, wrote, I should like to mention the impression I received during the course of my examination, namely that more hands have carried out the darning than is suggested in the historical records. Giovanni Rigi di Numano, who cut the sample in 1988, wrote, quote, I was authorized to cut approximately eight square centimeters of cloth from the shroud. This was then reduced to about seven centimeters because fibers of other origins had become mixed up with the original fabric. When Oxford looked at their sample, the late Edward Hall noticed fibers that looked out of place. A laboratory in Derbyshire determined that the rogue fibers were cotton of, quote, a fine dark yellow strand, end quote. According to Peter South of the lab, it may have been used for repairs at some time in the past. Professor Reyes, who had been given permission to extract a shroud sample in 1973, stated at the 1989 Paris Symposium that he believed that in the 1988 Oxford sample he examined, the cotton he observed was contained inside the threads, which could help to explain the difference in fiber diameter. Piero Savarino, the scientific advisor to Cardinal Paletto of Turin, stated in a 1998 booklet, quote, the 1988 C14 testing might have been erroneous due to extraneous thread left over from invisible mending routinely carried out in the past on parts of the cloth in poor repair. Savarino went on to emphasize, if the sample taken had been the subject of invisible mending, the carbon dating results would not be reliable. What is more, the site from which the samples actually were taken does not preclude this hypothesis." In 2014, an English translation of a book by the Savoy family archivist Carlos Avaristo was published. Uh, the Savoy family owned the shroud until it was uh, willed to the Pope in the 1980s. While discussing the seam that runs down the side of the shroud and along the area from which the samples were taken, he writes, the section could have been ordered or rewoven back onto the original hole or else the section in question was substituted with another piece of similar cloth. He added, another fact confirmed by His Majesty was that it was traditionally affirmed that at one point in the past, the edges of the sheet had become so tattered as to cause embarrassment or criticism of the custodians. And those areas were repaired and rewoven using identical techniques, but obviously with similar yet newer materials containing dyes and other medieval manufacturing ingredients in an attempt to better blend the new sections in as best possible with the original fabric. During the 1988, um, excuse me, the 1989 Paris Symposium, during the question and answer session, the late C14 scientist Jacques Avon was asked about the validity of the sample. And he said, I quite agree that the labs did not take the weaving techniques into account, and they did not date the threads per se. Thus, if the reeve was rewoven with threads from a modern restoration, this would be reflected in more modern results. <laughs> 
If in fact there are cotton fibers in the C14 area, one would expect to find evidence of chemical differences. The late STIRP chemist uh, Al Adler stated in an interview published in 1996, so you can talk all you want about how reproducible the data is, but you can't talk about how accurate it is. You have no way of knowing if the area you took the C14 sample from represents the whole cloth. That's an area which has obviously been repaired. There's cloth missing there. It's been rewoven on the, wed on the edge. They even cut part of it off because it was obviously rewoven on the edge. The simplest explanation why the date may be off is that it's rewoven cloth there, and that's not been tested. Dr. Adler, in a 1996 paper, showed a graph that illustrated the absorbance patterns of image, non-image, radiocarbon warp, water stain, scorch, and serum single fiber samples, and made the following statements. The patterns are all distinguishably different from one another, clearly indicating differences in their chemical composition. In particular, the radiocarbon samples are not representative of the non-image samples that comprise the bulk of the cloth. Belgian chemist Remy van Helst noted to pass the chi-square test, which determines comparability of two or more disparate samples, statisticians tell us that the calculated value should be lower than six. The chi-square test value for the shroud is 6.4, meaning that the subsamples cannot be considered identical or rather from the same representative sample. So we already have physical, chemical, and historical indications that the sample is probably anomalous. In 2000, my late wife Sue Benford and I presented our paper in Italy called Evidence for the Skewing of the C14 Dating of the Shroud of Turin Due to Repairs. Sue had taken photographs of both the Zurich and uncut C14 samples to European, European trained weaver David Pearson, owner of French tailors in Columbus, Ohio. Pearson was also showed a high quality close up of the C14 area. Pearson, who was not told that they were photographs of the shroud, immediately recognized the disparate weave pattern and differences in thread size, stating, There is no question that there is different material on each side. It is definitely a patch. He said that medieval European weavers would typically try to match the original cloth and then hand stitch approximately one half inch of new material into the old, such that it was invisible to all but the trained eye. This would ensure the long-term integrity of the material while maintaining aesthetic consistency throughout the fabric. This type of detail to repairs would be consistent with the wealth and devotion of the Savoy family who owned the shroud at the time. Sue also sent photos to two other institutions without telling them that they were from the shroud. A blinded analysis of a photograph of the Zurich C14 sample by Thomas Ferguson and Company Limited in uh, Ireland, world-renowned makers of double damask linen, resulted in their perception that the sample was, quote, touched up to prevent unraveling. They further observe we have to say that we see the twill pattern clearly on both sides, but still there is something different left versus right. In a third blinded analysis of the Zurich C14 sample by Albany International, Louise Harner remarked that, quote, the float is different on either side of the sample. It forms a thick, thin, thick, thin pattern on the right side, whereas the left is much more consistent throughout. When the phrase invisible reweaving uh, surfaced, many questioned whether such a technique uh, even existed. I now own three different manuals uh, called Invisible Mending, 1951, Invisible French Reweaving Simplified, 1954, and the Frenway System of French Reweaving, 1962. Another criticism has been that such a repair on the shroud would easily, would easily be visible on the backside, which will be addressed uh, in the next slide. According to that Frenway um, manual, quote, probably the reason this art of reweaving uh, 
has gone relatively unnoticed is the great secret, great secrecy which has heretofore kept all but a few people in the world in ignorance of the techniques involved. These secrets have been closely guarded and handed down from generation to generation to a select few. The only exceptions were people who paid huge sums in order to receive knowledge of the art. Every novice reweaver had to spend years as an apprentice. In the final word section on the last page of the book, they said, if you do your work well, very few people will ever be able to detect what you have done. In your case, to have your workmanship invisible is the test of your craftsmanship. Michael Ehrlich, owner, owner of Without a Trace uh, in Chicago, that's withoutatrace.com if you want to look at their website. Uh, he began invisible mending services in Chicago around the mid-1990s. And he was in, uh, quoted in a, uh, a book called The Case for Christ's Resurrection as saying, Today there is a modern time-saving technique called in-weaving that would be invisible from the surface but easily recognizable from the back. However, the technique used in 16th century Europe called French weaving is an entirely different matter. French weaving involves a tedious thread-by-thread -thread restoration that is indeed invisible. 16th century owners of the shroud certainly had enough material resources and weeks of time at their disposal to accomplish the task. Robert Budin, president of Tapestries and Treasures, which produces, imports, exports, and distributes high-quality historical tapestries to clients throughout the world, including 16th century pieces, was asked about the possibility of the shroud having an invisible reweave. Budin echoed some of Ehrlich's thoughts, quote, is there such a thing as an invisible repair? Yes, I have seen it, or more appropriately, not seen it in several types of textiles. But was this skill known to weavers in the 16th century? Did weavers of the 16th century possess the skill to invisibly repair textiles? Most definitely. Would the restoration of a holy relic like the Shroud of Turin be assigned to a novice or, or the finest craftsman in the land? I think the latter. Was budget a concern for the church or its noble owner at the time? Most likely not. Textile expert uh, Donald Campbell of Thomas Ferguson Limited in the UK uh, analysis, but she's working there currently, not right now. She examined some photos of the sample used by Oxford for their shroud C14 dating, and she said, "Yarns break during weaving." The success in identifying these breaks and fixing depends on the skill of the hand weaver. However, there are signs in the shroud sample that direct the notion of mending or reweaving of the actual woven fabric. The late Sterp chemist Ray Rogers thought that the repair hypothesis was nonsense until he started working on fibers located next to the C14 samples and later on an actual leftover sample from the 1988 dating and compared them, compared them to the fibers he still possessed from the main part of the cloth from the study in 1978. Rogers wrote in his paper, the presence of al alizarin dye and red lakes in the Reyes and radiocarbon samples indicates that the color has been manipulated. Specifically, the color and distribution of the coating implies that repairs were made at an unknown time with foreign linen dyed to match the older original material. The radiocarbon sampling area is uniquely coated with a yellow-brown plant gum dye, uh, plant gum containing dye lake, excuse me. Pyrolysis mass spectrometry results from the sample area coupled with microscopic and microchemical observations, proved that the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original cloth of the Shroud of Turin. 
The radiocarbon date was thus not valid for determining the true age of the shroud. End quote. Rogers found an encrustation of plant gum on the outside of the C14 sample fibers. Chemical and microscopic analysis showed embedded matter root dye particles. Rogers also enlisted the help of the late microscopist John Brown, who did his own analysis on Rogers fibers. Brown believed that after the area had been rewoven, dye was applied in an attempt to match the color of the shroud. Brown removed warp threads from weft threads, revealing undyed areas. According to Brown, undyed areas do not fluoresce like dyed areas, as shown in this ultraviolet photomicrograph. In both the Reyes and C14 samples, cotton fibers were found interwoven with the linen. Apart from some surface cotton fibers from STIRP members' gloves, no cotton was found anywhere else on the shroud. Gum and dye particle encrustations were found on the outer surface of many fibers. Here's another photo of gum and dye particle encrustations being found on the outer surface of the fibers. And here's one last photo micrograph of gum and dye particle encrustations being found on, those, uh, on the outer surface. Ray Rogers also sent some Reyes sample fibers, one that uh, had been right next to the C14 samples, to Los Alamos chemist Bob Villarreal, who confirmed Rogers' findings of a splice. Villarreal wrote, the many strands of fibers from the three threads analyzed gave FTIR signature of cotton and definitely did not give evidence of linen. Villarreal agreed with Rogers that the samples were not representative of the main shroud. French physician Thibault Heimberger wrote a three-part article on analyses of the ray sample that Rogers had and says this about um, the, this previous photo. This discovery is obviously of paramount interest for the following reasons. First, the splice is not at all obvious if we look at the photograph. Reyes did not see it. Rogers did, looking carefully at the sample with his microscope. Second, the brown resin-like crust described as a micro-sized circular cocoon-shaped brown crust could not be seen under the microscope. This is very surprising. Third, this shows that this part of the shroud has been managed thread by thread contrary to the main part of the shroud. Mark Oxley uh, points out in an article called Evidence is Not Proof, a, re a response to um, that whereas Dr. Joel of the Arizona lab measured the thickness of the radiocarbon samples at 250 microns, Italian writer Gian Rinaldi stated that the measurements of samples from the main part of the shroud or 390 microns, suggesting a different composition between main shroud fibers and C14 fibers. Uh, Bob Villarreal also enlisted the help of other scientists at Los Alamos, um, who basically uh, they c concluded that there had been repairs in the area. These next few slides, I'm not going to read these out. It, it lists the um, name of the scientist and the test, so I'll give you a couple seconds to look at those. One of those nine scientists, Dr. John Schoonover,
gave a PowerPoint presentation uh, to the American Chemical Society in St. Louis in 2009, and he said, thread is sus suspected to be from region of shroud repair. Archaeologist Paul Maloney presented at a conference in Ohio in 2008. Uh, he gave a list of those who had found cotton inside of the fibers in the Reyes corner. Gilbert Reyes himself, 1973-1974. Sterp's own early analyses reported by Sterp's spokeswoman, Joan Janney, 1981. Investigators at Precision Processes uh, Limited in England, 1988. Ray Rogers, 2004 investigations. John Brown at Georgia Tech, 2004. And Robert Villarreal and his team, 2008. In 2012, John M. Morgan III of the Geospatial Research and Education Laboratory at Towson University wrote a highly technical paper titled, Digital Image Processing Techniques Demonstrating the Anomalous Nature of the Radiocarbon Dating Sample Areas of the Shroud of Turin. And that that uh, article is available online. The techniques analyzed an ultraviolet shroud photo and the author concluded that there is evidence of cotton in the C14 area, which adds another source to Maloney's list of sources that show cotton in the C14 area. STIRP member imaging specialist, the late Jean Lohr, was asked about these photos called the blue quad mosaic, for which Lohr said different colors represent different chemical compositions. Barry Schwartz wrote an article that you can find on his website. Notice that the area adjoining the patch where the C14 sample was taken from and ostensibly part of the actual shroud is also mostly the same color of green. This is further convincing supportive scientific evidence that this area is inherently different in composition than the rest of the shroud. Barry also showed, um, excuse me, he, he sent um, kind of a private message to the shroud science group that Russ mentioned before. It's an uh, online group for researchers. Uh, and Barry sent um, kind of a private message uh, to the group. Um, I'm going to quote it here. He said, when I examined the C14 sample site at higher magnification in Photoshop, there seemed to be a darker area to the right of the seam that could be interpreted as a positive indication of manipulation. Barry also showed a white light image of the area and wrote, most notable is the very obvious darker coloration of the C14 sample site area adjacent to the seam, which fades gradually into the lighter color of the rest of the shroud. This is not a shadow. The shroud was definitely a different, meaning darker, shade in this area. In a 2005 paper by Dr. Alan Wenger and his wife Mary titled Radiological Aspects of the Shroud of Turin, they concluded, on studying the radiographs, I believe that the shroud had undergone multiple repairs. Cardinal Paletto, uh, the, the advisor to Cardinal Paletto, said that the 1988 C14 testing might have been erroneous due to extraneous thread left over from invisible mending routinely carried out in the past on parts of the cloth in poor repair. King Umberto's archivist, Carlos Avaristo, wrote in his book that according to King Umberto himself, the shroud was repaired and rewoven. Giovanni Rigi di Numano, who cut the C14 sample, stated, I was authorized to cut approximately eight square centimeters of cloth from the shroud. 
This was then reduced to about 7 centimeters because fibers of other origins had become mixed up with the original fabric. Oxford noticed cotton in their sample, and when it was analyzed by a lab, they said it may have been used for repairs at some time in the past. Professor Reyes, who had been given permission to uh, work on a shroud sample in 1973, stated in 1989 that he believed that the uh, Oxford sample from 1988 he examined, uh, the cotton he observed was contained inside the threads. French C-14 scientist Jacques Avon sta stated at the Paris Symposium 1989, I quite agree that the labs did not take the weaving techniques into account and they did not date the threads per, per se. Thus, if the weave was rewoven with threads from modern restoration, this would be reflected in more, results, in more modern results. The late Sturp chemist Al Adler said, you have no way of knowing if the area you took the C14 sample from represents the whole cloth. That's an area which has obviously been repaired. There's cloth missing there. It's been rewoven on the edge. Adler wrote in a 1996 paper, the patterns are all distinguishably different from one another, clearly indicating differences in their chemical composition. In particular, the radiocarbon samples are not representative of the non-image samples that comprise the bulk of the cloth. Belgian chemist Remy van Helst indicated that based on the chi-square test, the subsamples could not be considered identical. European-trained weaver David Pearson when blindly examining a photo of the C14 area stated, there is no question that there is different material on each side. It is definitely a patch. A blinded analysis of a photograph of the Zurich C14 sample by Thomas Ferguson and Company Limited resulted in their percep perception that the sample was touched up to prevent unraveling. Albany International remarked that the float is different on e either side of the sample. It forms a thick, thin, thick, thin pattern on the right side, whereas the left is much more consistent throughout. I have three different manuals, uh, Invisible Mending, Invisible French Reweaving Simplified, and the Frenway System of French Reweaving. Michael Ehrlich of Without a Trace said French, re French weaving involves a tedious thread-by-thread thread restoration that is indeed invisible. Robert Budin, uh, president of Tapestries and Treasure, stated, did weavers of the 16th century possess the skill to invisibly repair textiles? Most definitely. Donna Campbell of Thomas Ferguson Limited reported, there are signs in the shroud sample that direct the notion of mending or reweaving of the actual woven fabric. The late stir chemist Ray Rogers wrote in his 2005 paper, the radiocarbon sampling area is uniquely coated with a yellow-brown plant gum containing dye lakes. Pyrolysis mass spectrometry results from the sample area coupled with microscopic and microchemical observations prove that the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original cloth of the Shroud of Turin. The late microscopist John Brown, who looked at the samples that Rogers had, believed that after the area had been rewoven and dye, apply, dye was applied uh, in an attempt to match the color of the shroud. Dr. John Schoonover of Los Alamos National Laboratories uh, concluded thread is suspected to be from region of shroud repair. French physician uh, Thibault Heimberger said, this part of the shroud has been managed thread by thread, contrary to the main part of the shroud, echoing uh, Michael Ehrlich's comments about a tedious thread by thread restoration that is invisible. Paul Maloney cited six sources of cotton found inside the shroud, Gilbert Reyes, Joan Janney of Sterp, uh, Precision Processes Limited, Ray Rogers, John Brown, and Robert Villarreal and team. John Morgan's 2012 paper analyzed an ultraviolet shroud photo, and the author concluded that there was evidence of cotton in the C14 sampling area. Sterp photographer Barry Schwartz, discussing the Sterp uh, blue quad mosaic photo, said this is further 
convincing, supportive, scientific evidence that this area is inherently different in composition than the rest of the shroud. Discussing a transmitted light photo of the coroner, Schwartz said, when I examined the C14 sample site at higher magnification in Photoshop, there seemed to be a darker area to the right of the seam that could be interpreted as a positive indication of man manipulation. Discussing a white light photo of that corner, Schwartz noted, most notable is the very obvious darker coloration of the C14 sample site area adjacent to the seam, which fades gradually into the lighter color of the rest of the shroud. This is not a shadow. The shroud was definitely a different shade in this area. The Wangers wrote in their 2005 paper, examination of the site of the C14 single sample indicates that at least part of the sample was taken from one of these repaired or altered areas. There's a picture of Ray Rogers not long before he passed away in, in March 2005. Given all these points, I maintain that the been rewoven is the best explanation of why the C14 dating resulted in a medieval date. Ray Rogers, who wasn't even aware of all this data, was convinced by the chemical evidence alone that repairs had been made to the shroud. I'll conclude with a statement that he made to the shroud science group, to whom he patiently concluded or communicated with for several years, presenting a lot of the data that he was finding. And he said to the group, how much evidence is needed? Thanks again for your attention. Wait, I think he's going to need some help to switch to him. Uh, um, should I ask him to put it in the question? Um, on the paper and tonight.